Michelangelo is um, is never discouraged from his genius. I mean, he is sometimes forced to do work he doesn't want to do, often forced to do work he doesn't want to do, and we'll, we can talk about that with Michelangelo. One of the great tragedies of history is what happens, in a sense, to Michelangelo, because in my view, he's, he's the greatest sculptor of all, all, all of history, and yet he, he doesn't sculpt much because he's forced to paint, because that's what the Pope wants him to do. But when he's identified as a great sculptor, people come to him. You know, here's the um, here's a story about Michelangelo. Michelangelo's just this amazing kid. He's identified uh, as a sculptor early on. Uh, he's brought into the Medici household in a sense. In the, he, he sculpts in the um, in this in this garden school outside of the Medici place, and he is uh, um, he is admired for his sculpture. And at the age of twenty. At the age of 20, he goes to Rome, and he gets his first commission. And his first commission is to sculpt a Bacchus, 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 something like that, the god of wine. And the god of wine, you know, is, 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 a, is a, of course, a, a, a Greek, a, a Roman god, a Greek god, Greek god. And often the god of wine in sculpture before Michelangelo is always portrayed as the strong, you know, raising a glass of wine, kind of very powerful, positive, almost heroic character. Um, and Michelangelo, and I, you know, it'd be interesting to go into the reasons. I, 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 I would be interested in going into the reasons for this, but Michelangelo instead portrays a god of wine who is just, this is Dionysus, of course, in Greek. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, who is a little tipsy. He, he's a little drunk. He's got a beautiful body, but it's, it's, it's a body that's he's standing in kind of a relaxed pose. And his eyes, you can see, are a little out of focus. And it's a work of genius. I mean, you can see it in Florence at the Bodello, Bodello Gallery. It's an amazing sculpture. And, but he is, he's clearly, he's clearly drunk. He's the god of wine. He's what you think of with the god of wine. And I wouldn't be surprised if Michelangelo here is doing a sculpture that's trying to critique the person who actually commissioned the sculpture in a sense of, you Christians who love wine, this is what you look like. It's a nude. It's an amazing sculpture if you go and see it, right? Not heroic. It doesn't necessarily appeal to me thematically. But when you look at what he's done and how he conveys what he's trying to convey, it's a magnificent piece of work. Anyway, when he shows this, the guy who does the commission says, go away. I mean, I'm not going to pay you for this. Oh, you know, th that's, this is ridiculous. This is not what I expected. I expected a heroic, you know, celebratory, toasting god of wine. And you can see in the Bodello, there are other, uh, there are other gods of wine exactly the same you know, with that more heroic, more positive theme. So you can see the contrast of what the, the guy wanted as part of the commission. Well, uh, Michelangelo, uh, you know, has, is, is stuck with this. Ultimately, the Medicis buy this and, it, and they ship it back to Florence because it's such a great work of art and they realize that. But uh, Michelangelo is in trouble now and, and he, he needs another commission desperately. And there is a, uh, there is a competition to do a pieta. Pieta is basically is Mary holding the dead Jesus in her arms. And Michelangelo sculpts in marble a pieta. And if you've never seen the pieta by Michelangelo, the first one he does, he does at least three. Um, but, but, and the other two are not, not, never finished, but this one is finished. Um, you've got to go, it's, it's, in, it's in the Vatican Museum, it's in the Vatican in Rome. Unfortunately, you can't get very close to it. It's behind glass because somebody at some point took a shot at it with a gun. Uh, so they put it behind glass. It is just one of the most stunning pieces of art ever. It is a woman holding her son who is dead on her knees. The son is strong you know, heroic to the extent you can tell from a dead body, and she is mourning, and you can tell from her expression. You can tell from the way her hands hold him. 
You can tell just from the way the clothes are draped over her. It's just a stunningly amazing, unbelievably beautiful sculpture that evokes all the emotion that I think a pieta should evoke. Now, I want to make a point here. Sidelines. So we're going in all kinds of directions today. But hopefully, hopefully this is a value to you. Um, why can one look at a pieta and a Jesus on a cross and have a positive aesthetic experience? It's Jesus. And I hate Christianity. Here I said it. I hate Christianity. I've said it many times. And yet here's the symbol of Christianity. And yet when you look at a pieta or you look at some of the magnificent paintings during the Renaissance and later of, of, a, of a crucifixion, or if you look at Dali's crucifixion, which Ayn Rand really liked, um, what is it about a crucifixion that is so powerful? And how can one abstract, how can one, how can one enjoy it in a sense? Or get something out of it. And I think to me, is I abstract away from the Christian part of it. And I think of Jesus as a, as a, as a, as a fighter for a new set of ideas. As somebody who believes in a new set of ideas and is fighting to have them manifest in the world. Somebody heroic who is going around advocating for new ideas. And who is put to death because of his ideas. Jesus did not commit a crime. He did not kill anybody. Not rape anybody. He did not steal from anybody. He was a man punished for speaking. In a sense, the crucifixion, I'm, put, I'm putting aside all the Christian meaning, which it means to Christians. I'm putting what it means to me is a sign, a symbol of the injustice, of injustice, of what happens to heroes so many times throughout history. Yeah, by the way, yeah, so many times throughout history that where people who advocate for new ideas, people who advocate for radical ideas, get crucified, get crucified. And in art that is actually presents Jesus as heroic, that is manifest physically heroic, right? Intelligent face, intelligent expression, heroic body, muscles, alive, not a symbol of sacrifice, but a representation of an injustice committed to a heroic figure, to a heroic man. To that extent, I can enjoy a crucifixion in a sense that it projects back to me, it concretizes the injustice that often occurs. And you can, you can benefit from, you can get from portrayals of injustice a huge amount. It, it is real. And this is why I can enjoy like Dark Ages or Middle Ages crucifixions. But when you get into the Renaissance, particularly into the High Renaissance, the later Renaissance, Michelangelo's period, it's amazing. And then when you look at the Pietà, this Pietà of Michelangelo's. I mean, here's a hero. Here's the mother of a hero. And the tragedy of it, the sadness of it, and yet the beauty of it are so striking. Now, the Pietà was universally, immediately identified as a great work of art. But people said, who did it? And somebody said, Michelangelo. They said, no, that can't be. Michelangelo did that stupid Bacha sculpture. It can't be Michelangelo. Michelangelo is a nobody, and he, he can't sculpt like this. There's no way he could do this. So there was, a, there was a, a, a general rumor going around that it wasn't Michelangelo who sculpted the painting. So one night, uh, who sculpted the Pieta. So one night, um, Michelangelo snuck into the place where the sculpture was stored, and he chiseled into the strap that goes across Mary's body, Michelangelo did this, or something to the equivalent of that. Michelangelo sculpted this. Only sculpture he ever signed. After that, he didn't need to sign any sculpture because everybody knew a Michelangelo when they saw it. Um, 
of course, his reputation, uh, the, the Pieta, made Michelangelo's reputation. He, he was immediately elevated to being the number one sculpture of the sculptor of the Renaissance, uh, sculptor of his generation, and maybe, and I believe, ultimately of all time. If you, uh, he then goes back to Florence, and in Florence, there's a big piece of marble sitting, and it's been there, I don't know, I can't remember the exact timing, but something like 80 years it's been there. It's been there a long time. And uh, two sculptors have tried to sculpt into this. They've already chiseled into it. So uh, they've chiseled into the top and they've chiseled into the, into, into the bottom. And so they've already tried to sculpt it. And both sculptors, this is a massive piece of marble, they both walked away saying, this is impossible. It is impossible to, uh, to use this piece of marble. It's, it's not a good piece of marble. It's, 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 it's too big, but there are flaws in it. There are problems with it. We can't do it. And this piece of marble is just sitting there. It's owned by the city of Florence. And Michelangelo goes, um, and he, he goes to, uh, to, to the leaders of Florence, and he says, um, I want to I wanna do this. And they say, no, nobody can do it. It's just, it's, we need to trash this piece of marble. Nobody can sculpt it. It's useless. And they've already started. So you couldn't do anything anyway. He says, no, I, I want to do this. And he bugs them. And he bugs them. And he bugs them. And he's got this reputation. And he's a young kid. He's 25 years old by this point. And, um, you know, the Medici's, he's from kind of, uh, originally from the, you know, the Medici's like him. So then they say, okay, do it. Take it and do it. And here's this piece of marble that everybody else thought was un... You couldn't carve anything from it. And where the carvings had already been done. Now, marble is not like bronze. Bronze, you, you, you sculpt in clay. And in clay, you can add, you can subtract, you can change, you can change your mind, you can redo it, you can move things. Marble, once you chisel something away, it's gone. You don't stick it back. It's gone forever. So some of the pieces have already been chiseled away. And Michelangelo sets this up in a studio, and he works on it. And out of that piece of marble comes, in my view, the greatest sculpture that's ever been produced, the David. And it is truly a magnificent piece of work. I mean, and, and, and the more you see it, the more you see it up close. And when you understand marble and you see the flaws in the marble, the marble was flawed. And the fact that Michelangelo can work in spite of the flaws in the marble, can create this magnificent piece of work in his mid-20s is, is, you know, is truly, truly stunning. Now here's a David who is again naked. He's nude. He stands with confidence in front of Goliath with a look of concentration, focus on what he has to do. It is the moment before he strikes, before the fight begins. Most Davids are either are, are the moment afterwards with the head of Goliath already there, the moment of victory, Donatello's Goliath, Vocaccio's Goliath, of, of, all at the moment of victory. Later, Bernini will sculpt a magnificent David, which is at the moment of action. You can see David, you know, in action, using his, uh, what do you call it? Uh, anyway, getting that stone, using uh, this sling. Yeah, Jennifer, that is a picture that's a kind of a drawing of uh, Michelangelo's David in, in the background over there. It's, it's really... It's really special. Um, uh, the primary purpose of art is contemplation for its own sake. So that the purpose here is for the reader to see what greatness man is capable of is, and to be inspired by that. If so as I read Atlas to... Shrugged then, uh, and any one of the heroic characters, Hank Reardon or John Galt or uh, Francisco, these give me a model of the kind of person I might be? If you wish. But that isn't my purpose in writing. I see. My purpose is for you to look at those people mm -hmm. and to
to enjoy the spectacle. As a secondary consequence, you might find yourself inspired. Yeah. That's fine. But I want to give you that experience. And that's what I want to give myself. I write for the purpose of creating an ideal man in actions which you can yeah. respect and admire. From what you say about art, I would judge you do not regard photography as art, since it records precisely what is there. How do you feel about abstract art? Uh, do you mean non-objective? Non-objective. I yes. think it's uh, uh, less art than photography. I think it is an enormous fraud. Fraud? Yes. Mm. I don't think there's... Um, it's impossible to discuss it seriously. Mm. It means nothing. It is nothing. The perpetrators claim that they don't know what they're doing. And I think they're right. I'm willing to take them at their word. They don't know what they're doing, and neither do we. And uh, the Ashken is the proper place for it. Mm. But I